Okay, perfect. All right, hello everyone and welcome. Today we're delighted to have a talk by Marius Lem, uh, and he's going to be uh, to be telling about us, uh, us about light cones for open quantum systems. So, Marius, take it away. So, hi everybody. Um, thanks to the organizers for the invitation uh, to speak here, uh, and also thanks to the previous organizers and uh, Jan Derzinski and Daniel Lucci for creating this wonderful seminar, which uh, is at the top of my YouTube playlist. Um, and um, yeah, so this is going to be talk on some joint works with Sébastien Breton, Jérémy Faupin, David Ouyang, Israel Michael Siegel, and Jingxuan Zhang, who just defended his PhD. Um, and it, the title is Open uh, Light Cones for Open Quantum Systems. So let me jump right in. So this is going to be about propagation bounds um, in quantum mechanics. So let's focus on some simple model case, just for motivational purposes. I'll look at the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for the simplest case, I think, is a single free quantum particle. So we just have the Laplacian, no potential, and we all know that this can be diagonalized by Fourier transform um, in the continuum. And for Gaussian initial states, we can write down the solution exactly. And so let's take as an initial state a Gaussian that sort of shifted in momentum space by some fixed vector k0. So I give the Gaussian some you know, initial K0 momentum. So the initial Fourier transform is a Gaussian centered around K0. Okay, And now I let the dynamics run, uh, the free time evolution, what happens to this Gaussian, how does this wave packet propagate? So initially it's localized near the origin. I don't see the phase when I take the absolute value. And then how does it propagate? Well, the you can write down the formula exactly. And here's the formula for psi T of X squared. So the wave function at time T and position X. And that's given by another Gaussian. Um, and the Gaussian, as you see, it's centered around K0T. So here's the picture. It starts at the origin, and time runs. And it's now centered at K0T, the new center. So it moves with velocity K0. And uh, the spread is of the order T, sort of. It also starts sort of diffusing. Okay. Um, so this is sort of just one class of initial states, but we can already sort of learn what we can maybe hope for or expect in sort of propagation in non-relativistic quantum theory. So there's a non-relativistic model, right? There's no a priori any light cone in this in this theory. Um, um, however, sort of we see that there's some kind of maximal speed that the particle exhibits. More precisely, if you look at it, right, there's this speed K0t at which the center moves. So the, sorry, the center moves at speed K0. So it moves at, K, at position K0t. And so there's a little bit of spreading. So if I am willing to make some cut here and ignore the exponential tails, then the cut sort of, if I make it roughly speaking at something like uh, K zero plus one T or plus 10 times T, you know, if I'm willing to go a little bit further than K zero, then I can, I'm only losing some exponentially tiny uh, probability mass. So, so the effective speed is through K zero plus some constant. So it's essentially K zero. So let's sort of take a step back and try to think about this. What can we, how can we formulate this more abstractly? We saw for these Gaussians. So we have this non-relativistic quantum Hamiltonian, the free Laplacian, and the propagation that comes for Gaussian initial data. So stays inside this effective light cone. We call this, it's a light cone quotation marks because it's not actually the speed of light that's giving the slope. It's an effective light cone because errors outside of the light cone are only small, they're not zero. In relativity, the sort of no correlation spreading, no part of the state spreading outside of the light cone here. It's just so sort of these Gaussian tails that I'm, if I say I'm allowed to ignore them, then I have light cone. So here, right in this picture, there's space and there's time, and most of the Gaussian wave packet sort of stays inside that light cone region. And the slope of the light cone, which is the maximal speed, exhibited by the system had to do with this K0, this initial momentum that I give the particle. And that's essentially, right, as the free Laplacian. So momentum is essentially square root of the energy um, up to maybe some order one constant. So, so these two observations already occur in a sort of very simple setting. I take Gaussians in the continuum and I see there is a light cone, but the slope of the light cone, the maximal speed, depends on the energy of the initial state, okay? So um, in a setting like in the continuum where the energy is unbounded, um, the, the 
slope can be arbitrarily large, but it is sort of depending on the initial state. Okay. So we can sort of have a hope to prove a propagation estimate that depends on the energy in some way, also in the continuum. So the broad question here is sort of what kind of non-relativistic quantum mechanical models have a type of maximal speed um, phenomenon? This is certainly sort of a fundamental question. Um, you can think about sort of various applications where this may be useful also. Um, you know, very broadly, sort of to if you make a perturbation and you want to see how quickly does the at time zero, how quickly does the perturbation spread in space, then it'll spread sort of like, you know, like a ball of radius T, roughly speaking, if you have an estimate like this. Uh, it actually turns out that sort of these kind of dynamical estimates are also useful in doing spectral theory and understanding spectral projectors, uh, especially in the presence of a spectral gap. That's basically the reason is basically that time is the Fourier dual variable to energy. Um, and that is an observation that's really been exploited by, by Hastings in a slightly different context that I'll get to. Uh, but before I do that, let me sort of just take a step back and say, so this is about this question that we want to address in this talk and in this area is not about sort of deriving effective theories in some specific parameter regime, but instead we're trying to look at some broad classes of Hamiltonians, non-relativistic quantum theories, um, and we want sort of to derive a priori bounds. The bounds will likely not be optimal in a concrete scenario. The point of the bounds is that they're widely applicable and you don't have to work hard, hopefully, to apply them and they give you some a priori information. It's more like that, instead of sort of trying to derive some effective theory. Okay, so, um, so here's a sort of very incomplete history of propagation bounds in quantum mechanics. I've separated this, as you can see, in sort of two columns. Um, that's just a choice. And so there's one side of the story that's sort of few body interactions, or even one body interactions in continuous space. And there's another side of the, the table that's many body interactions in discrete space. The challenges are different, okay? Um, in few body systems, there's no particle number you sort of have to track. You don't have to sort of uh, fight with getting bounds that are sort of stable in the, in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, the challenge there is sort of in con the continuous space and the fact that energy is unbounded, as we actually saw for the Gaussians, right? And so to somehow track energy. Um, this is so you can also say few body another way to say few bodies i guess to say zero density and infinity right so it's maybe an atom with a few particles uh on the other side there's many body here i really think of something maybe a lattice system right because discrete space i have some fixed volume and have some positive density also in the limit and i want to prove bounds that are independent of the particle number or the number of sites and so there have been sort of developments in bo on both sides. So there's uh, on the few body side, there was a work by Sofa Siegel, which came out of their analysis of asymptotic completeness and scattering theory. Um, and there have been some, a couple of subsequent works uh, proving sort of propagation estimates of this type. So if not about scattering theory, but really sort of these type of a priori bounds I was talking about, but there have been overall fewer works on the left side than on the right. On the right side, the story starts with a very famous paper by Lee Robinson, um, which proves sort of finite group velocity bounds for quantum spin systems. So quantum spin systems is an example of systems that are many body on discrete space. Um, and uh, sort of this field sort of uh, experienced a huge surge in activity um, in the early 2000s, uh, in a large part due to Matt Hastings realizing that these Lee Robinson bounds can be used to understand ground states of gapped Hamiltonians, and um, in particular prove the area law for entanglement entropy. And sort of afterwards, there's been a huge uh, number of works on extensions of Lee Robinson bounds and applications. Here's, for example, two works that prove that um, a gap implies exponential decay of correlations in a ground state that uses Lee Robinson bounds as a tool. And sort of this whole story um, here has been sort of a huge, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of at least 100 papers that could fit in the side of the table. So sort of it's a huge field. And um, there have been many, many generalizations and extensions of these original Lee Robinson bounds. Uh, for example, I list some at the bottom here to oscillator systems, discrete open quantum systems. I mentioned that specifically here because we'll talk about continuous open quantum systems today, uh, to lattice fermions, um, and to long range interactions. Okay. So that's sort of the backdrop in which all this is happening. So today's talk is mainly considered with something from this side, because I'll be talking about open quantum systems in the continuum. 
But the methods, as we'll see, and as I'll briefly mention on this next slide, uh, they also actually are able to derive some bounds in its, its totally different setting. Um, so the methods have some robustness to them, um, which also makes them applicable in sort of the right side of the column. But today's focus is on the left, a particular type of systems on the left side. Okay. So let's see. So two challenges that sort of have existed until recently, um, if you sort of look at these tables and you fill on all the dot, dot, dots, um, one challenge was open quantum systems in the continuum. So in the discrete case, uh, open quantum systems had been treated um, to, to a good degree of generality. Um, but in the continuum, there's some challenge because, of course, you may want to say, aha, I have a Hamiltonian, I cut off my energy, uh, but that energy cutoff is not preserved in time, right? Because if you have an open system, the environment can inject energy and take out energy. So if the environment has positive temperature, it sometimes really injects energy. Uh, and we're talking about bounds at finite times. So you have to sort of deal with this large potential growth of energy for short times. That's something to deal with. Uh, basically, I'm saying the environment can ask, add fast modes. Uh, that's one challenge. Um, so you think of your galaxy and now interacts with the heat bath, and sometimes the heat bath kicks the galaxy. Um, and the other regime, uh, or another re uh, type of topic that belongs to the other side of the column, the many-body discrete story, is lattice bosons, where the challenge is that contrary to quantum spin systems, they have unbounded local interactions, which just come from the fact that bosons can pile up. Uh, the boson local particle number of bosons is unbounded, which sort of poses several challenges in the proofs. You may, of course, bound them by the total particle number if your Hamiltonian is particle number conserving, but that's not a nice bound that you want to use uh, because it sort of ruins your thermodynamic stability. Um, okay, so I won't talk much about lattice bosons, but I just want to make this uh, comment that uh, the met method that we'll use for considering problem one um, is uh, going to be uh, also applicable after some modifications to this problem two. Uh, so part of the point of the talk is to sort of really uh, advertise this method as something that seems to be quite robust for proving propagation bounds. Um, and also, while I talk about nearest, while I talk about lattice bosons, uh, I should mention that there's been sort of significant activity in that area, and there have been really nice works by Lucas Yin and Kuwaharu Vu Saito, uh, who uh, have treated, I mean, I think to a really uh, great degree of precision, the nearest neighbor lattice boson case. Um, we'll talk a little bit about long-range bosons later if there's time. Um, and so long-range sort of creates some different challenges. But I, I really think that's an on, I want to emphasize this. I think this lattice boson story is sort of ongoing and very interesting. But I will not talk much about it um, in the rest of the time. Okay. Um, very good. So then let me move on to the main topic. So open quantum systems in the continuum. So that's the kind of systems that we want to look at mainly today, and we want to prove propagation bounds for them. So be before I sort of formulate um, the results, let me sort of give you some kind of for some kind of physical idea of what kind of systems we might be looking at, and then a mathematical definition on the next slide. So an open quantum system is basically given by two ingredients. I have a system, um, a quantum system that's what we ordinarily think of as, as a closed system that's described by a Hamiltonian. In our case, we'll take a Schrodinger operator, minus Laplacian plus V on L2 of RD, okay? So, you know, you can think of this as an electron in, or several electrons actually in, um, in some kind of background, okay? Um, so but I say, I say so this should be a few body system. So what I really mean by that is that we won't track the dependence of our bounds on dimension. So if I have a very large number of particles, the dimension would grow with n. We will not track the dimension dependence. So um, that's what I mean by sort of a few-body Hamiltonian. Um, all right. Now, ingredient two. Um, so we have the system, quantum system. Now this gets coupled to an environment that interacts with the system. And this will be described in the usual formalism by a family of Krauss operators, a priori an infinite family. And so we want to think of this environment. You can think of this in various ways. There's many ways you can couple a quantum system to an environment. One is that maybe there's an ambient field, possibly a quantum field, 
could be uh, also, for example, uh, the atoms in a crystalline lattice, or it could be the radiation field um, that, you know, particle and atom, electron and atom helps the radiation field, or it could be something totally different, a little bit more related to measurement and decoherence, where you have sort of particle detectors that are localized in space. And if your electron hits them, it maybe it gets captured or there's some decoherence effect as it flies through. So it's sort of, it's a very broad, um, you know, possibility of physical processes where I have some system interacting in some way with the environment. And we wanna be purposefully broad, right? So the one of the lessons from the Robinson bounds is that in, for proving these sort of a priori bounds and for having them be useful, it is often a value to sort of try to be, be very general. Um, you can try to improve them later in specific situations, but sort of they're, they're especially valuable if you can sort of apply them without having to, to check a lot of conditions or without having to understand the physics of the system very well. Um, okay, so that's why I'm sort of being purposely kind of general here. Uh, what's the rule of thumb for when we need uh, to describe a system as an open quantum system? Um, roughly speaking, if the uh, quantum system entangles with the environment. But you can also think of the potential V as um, being some environment that you know electron is subjected to, but that's somehow a stationary environment that doesn't really change. Now, if you have an environment that the particle can entangle with, then clearly what it will happen, a pure state on the uh, space of particle and environment through, if they entangle, will evolve into a mixed state. Um, sorry, will evolve into a pure state on the whole system, but then the uh, reduced density matrix of the system itself will be a mixed state. And so therefore, the purity gets lost. However, if you have a unitary time evolution, purity is preserved. And so we need to have a dynamics on density matrices. Um, and this is what open quantum systems provide. So here's just a sketch of some, you know, some electron with some spin flying through a magnet. And then you know, the electron spin gets entangled with the magnet. That's just some, some example of something like that happening where sort of the, uh, an internal degree of freedom in this case, uh, it gets entangled with um, part of the environment. The environment's localized here. So that, that's, that's possible. So I use the environment very broadly just the other part in the open quantum system that's not the system. Okay, so, so that's sort of the, sort of the physical uh, backdrop. And now I want to define things mathematically. Um, so let's see. So we'll use the Lindblatian formalism, which relies on the Markovian assumption, which essentially says that the environment has no memory. Um, so if the environment has no memory, sort of the, the effect that the physical quantum system that we're looking at has on the environment is essentially negligible. Um, and, and so, okay, then um, we describe the dynamics of the state on our system. So we don't describe the environment, just the state of our system. It's given by density matrix, right? Initial times row zero, of the initial density matrix. And then uh, row T at time T is given by the solution to this von neumann lindblad equation. Um, so, the operator on the right is called the Lindbladian, um, has two parts. The first part, I say, is the standard dynamics. So suppose there is no environment, right? Then the Lindbladian is just conjugate, conjugating by H up to minus I. If there is no environment, then the solution of this equation is just given by unitary conjugation. Unitary conjugation on a state, you know, from the left and from the right is the same as Schrodinger dynamics. Um, and so if there is no environment, this is just the usual Schrodinger evolution or von Neumann evolution, depending on your uh, preference. Um, but now with the environment, there's the sort of environment contribution that comes from these, these cross in these cross operators that describe how uh, the environment acts on your system. Now the explicit form of these cross operators can be quite complicated, or they're hard to derive. They're hard to derive explicit formulas for these cross operators uh, in, in model systems. I won't discuss sort of deriving this formalism. I just want to say that um, in the case where things are bounded, it's quite well understood how to go from the sort of the Markovian assumption of the Lindbladian. Um, but, but in general, this is not an easy problem to derive this. But we take this as our starting point. Um, and I just want to sort of sum up this, this slide by looking at the semi-group that's generated by this. So e to the TL indexed by positive times this is a semi-group of completely positive and trace-preserving maps, and linear actually, um, which makes them quantum channels. 
So what are quantum channels? That they're, they're precisely completely positive and trace preserving linear maps. Uh, and quantum channels map quantum states to quantum states. Okay, so if I start with a row zero, that's a density matrix in the sense that row zero is a positive definite operator that has trace one, then row T will have those two properties at all times and the map will be linear. So it you know, preserves quantum states. Um, there's no loss of particles here. There's uh, traces preserved. Okay, so, so this is the kind of dynamics. So we, we look at this kind of equation, which is you know, an extension of uh, Schrodinger dynamics uh, so we have this additional part in the generator, and we want to ask, is there some finite speed of propagation for this? That's the question we want to ask. Clearly, this will require some assumptions on, well, H is a shorting operator. This will require some assumption on the potential that sits inside H and some assumptions on these Ws. Okay. So let's talk about what could we mean by a sort of light cone type estimate for these kind of systems. So what's our goal? Um, all right, so let's assume that the initial quantum state, row zero, is localized, perfectly localized in a region big X, capital X. So I know I phrase it like this, the trace of row zero, the total trace is one. So if I if I say the trace over the against the indicator function X is one, that's equivalent to saying that the trace against the indicator function of the complement is zero. That means it sits fully inside, you know, at time zero, it sits fully inside here. And so let me say, sort of roughly speaking, that's the support of row zero, right? So it's fully inside this region X. And now we let time run. We look at the solution to this uh, von neumann lindblad equation from the previous slide. You know, I take commutator with H, I take it with these Ws, and I get rho T um, by applying the solution operator. Now the question is, you know, if there's a finite speed of propagation, everything's initially localized in region X, then after time t, if I enlarge the region by something linear in time, then most of rho t should be in the enlarged region. So I'll sort of put the sort of in-between part, make it red, right? So that's xvt and sort of rho, rho t is mainly in here, mainly in there. And mainly is similar, right? We already saw that for the Gaussian, we can never hope to have perfect light cones in quantum theory. There's always sort of leakage of very small probability tails, just because the exponential immediately sort of spreads across um, the entire space. But if we're willing to make, to ignore small errors where we can have a hope for having approximate uh, light cones or effective light cones. Um, and so, so that's the idea. So suppose we take some V that's sufficiently large. So V should be, larger than the maximal speed um, because I want to sort of outrun the maximal speed a little bit to capture most of rho t. Um, and then I want to say that, you know, rho t is mainly in the red and green region. So I guess I should add the, you know, the red, re the green region is still allowed, of course. I'm not saying it propagates outward. It can also stay inside. That would still be allowed uh, in a propagation estimate. Okay. So that's kind of uh, the idea, uh, the kind of result we're aiming for. So just a few remarks about what this is not, um, because in the context of open quantum systems, something people have studied a lot is return to equilibrium, which you know is a very important and natural question that context where you start from some system, the environment says that some temperature is a heat bath, and uh, you want the, to see that the system uh, approximates, uh, well, e equilibrates. And uh, that's a lot of a long time question where things you know, like Fermi-Golden rule, dissipation become relevant. Uh, this is not about that. Um, this is about, in some sense, short time bounds. I'm looking at how much do I deviate from the initial state? Or rather, our bounds should be sort of hold in space time uh, whenever the distance is large compared to time, whenever I'm outside the light cone along the whole dynamics. Right? So the starting point is not actually important. Not, there shouldn't be large time bounds. We're not trying to describe some asymptotic regime a very large time, we're trying to sort of instead derive a priori bounds along the dynamics. Um, okay, I don't know if this is helpful to, to people that sort of have studied return to equilibrium, but I'm just trying to emphasize it's a different question. The Hamiltonian case, um, sort of propagation without the Ws, was done in uh, great generality by Arbunich, Pesateri, Sigal, Sofa, building on the Sigal, Sofa paper from, from 88. Um, okay, so 
the what's the main challenge in this context? What, Mario, what, sorry, yeah. what, what is the conclusion for this Hamiltonian case? So you have V and this holds for T uniformly or or whatever? Yeah, good question. So there's sort of different ways you can ask it. The easiest thing you can do is make the potential constant, not time dependent, then the energy cutoff is preserved. Mm -hmm. And then the conclusion is indeed that the velocity is square root of the energy. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they also treat the case with time-dependent potentials mm -hmm. where you need to do something else. You do some asymptotic um, um, spectral localization. Mm -hmm. um, that's more subtle. Um, but, but okay, let's just focus on you know time-independent. Yeah, so then square root of the energy is the right answer, which was what we saw for the Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So from the Gaussian case, right, we know that the speed must depend on the energy, or if you like, from what I just said about the other paper, we know that the speed must depend on the energy and we expect that something be like squared energy. However, in the case of an open quantum system, energy is not conserved. Right? So maybe we may say the initial state has some fixed energy and we hope that you know E, some energy cutoff, and we hope that somehow this means its velocity is at most square root E. But you know, for general environments and for intermediate times, the environment can sort of add fast modes occasionally. It's sort of it's, this, this, it's a very complicated process. At long times, maybe you're equilibrating, maybe the environment's dissipative, slows you down, but sort of in between, um, various things could happen and we're trying to not be making very strong assumptions on Lindblad and strong physical assumptions, we're trying to be very general. And so we need to deal with it somehow that the energy cutoff is not preserved. So somehow we need to handle the energy cutoff dynamically uh, without assuming sort of specific structure of the Lindblad. Um, okay. So here's our assumptions, and the next thing will then be our main result. Um, so uh, clearly, we need to assume some locality of the operator. The whole story with dynamical bounds is that you have some operator that defines your dynamics, and you assume that it's local in some sense. It doesn't connect too far regions in space. If your system is some kind of mean field system where everybody talks to everybody, how could you possibly prove some kind of propagation estimate? So you need to have some kind of decay assumption on your operator or some kind of control on how it spreads, uh, connects different regions in space. This is also, you know, um, in the context of Lee Robinson bounds, the, you know, the decay of the interaction is sort of the crucial assumption. Um, and that's where long range can be more challenging. So here are sort of our locality assumptions on, in the case of these open quantum systems. So we fix some integer n, I made it red because really a fixed integer. Think of it as three or seven or 10, okay? It's some fixed integer and we assume sort of Basically, it's you can think of it as some kind of moment assumption, some kind of polynomial decay that we assume up to n. That's roughly speaking what's going to happen. So I'm assuming here that the potential, uh, you know, its derivative up to n decay. There's some initial decay even for the potential itself, uh, but you know the the potential itself can decay ra rather slowly. It's just an epsilon there, um, but um, but um, so you know this it's outside of the regime of scattering theory. Um, but um, but um, overall, we do have some assumption of those are higher derivatives. And the cross operators similarly have to be local um, and sort of I summarize this in words that you don't have to parse the entire assumption that they sort of collectively localize in phase space, okay? And so some examples of Ws you can take, um, let's just make them finitely many just to not have to worry about the sum. And then if I take them to be Schwartz functions, sort of multiplication operators by Schwartz functions or Fourier multipliers by Schwartz functions, then this assumption is holds. Um, in fact, then it holds for every little n. As you might imagine, if n is something about polynomial decay, if I assume Schwartz function, I get sort of all the polynomial decay. Um, these are sort of models of particle detectors. So they sort of, the Ws that are position space, they will lead to decoherence in position um, and the ones in momentum space will lead to decoherence in momentum. And sort of we think of sort of decoherence as modeling measurement. And this is, I think, really nicely discussed in a paper about scattering theory for these equations by Falconi, Hopa, Fule, Shibnel. Um, yeah, so, and I think that's sort of one example of Ws to keep in mind. So you put sort of these sort of local Schwartz functions in um, different positions. And then in those regions, the in the position space representation, your density matrix will decohere. So become diagonal is what I mean by de decoherence. 
Um, or more generally, we could use them, the Ws to be sort of differential operators with polynomially decaying symbols, where the polynomially decaying is related to the N in some way. Um, so again, this is purposefully rather broad. Uh, I just want to sort of say my, the ingredients that make up my operator, my Lindbladian, are have locality properties. They're local. Uh, they have some kind of decay on some polynomial scale. Okay. And these are not at all optimal. We didn't fight to optimize this. One sort of, I think, remark that's worth making is that we can make the Ws time dependent. Um, so and as long as the assumption is uniformly in time, um, which sort of means you can also model some non-Markovian situations, right? So Markovian means that the Lindbadian is time independent because the environment has no memory. And then if you make these Ws time dependent, of course, that that, that is something in principle non-Markovian. Never mind how you precisely derive such an operator from some in some concrete system, but um, sort of suppose I'm, I'm given such an operator that models my dynamics, then we can treat time dependent things as well. Okay. So here's the main result. So now from now on, I'll just require these locality assumptions on the V's and W's for this fixed N. Okay. So that's sort of my locality of my system, uh, Hamil uh, not Hamiltonian, Lindbladia. Um, and then something else I definitely need to do somehow is an energy cutoff. Um, and so I call GE some smooth energy cutoff. So here is sort of little GE is a cutoff function that goes up to E, smooth cutoff function, and I apply it to, you know, spectral calculus, I apply it to the Hamiltonian H. That's then a smooth version of a spectral projector. And I like smoother versions because I'll take derivatives at some. Um, so that's sort of a spectral localizer. And so here's the theorem. Um, so it says there exists a maximal speed kappa, which is finite, uh, which will be sort of the slope of the light cone, such that the following holds. Now let's take an initial quantum state, rho zero, that's localized in the compact region. So remember, this means it's localized, right? It has no part in X complement. So it's fully localized in X, and there was this picture of X growing. Uh, then... If I take V bigger than kappa, if I make the growth of the region outpace the maximal speed, then we have this falling propagation estimate. So it's, it's in the box. Let's try to parse it. So I take rho T, my the solution at time T. I also apply the spectral localizer. So I take my rho T, I cut off its energy. I'm only looking at the bounded energy part of my solution because the high energy part, I have no hope anyway. Um, and then I look how much of it made it outside XR outside xr, and then this is small, polynomially small, if r is bigger than vt. So let me move on to the next page because there's the picture again. Uh, so I have all of my initial state, right, is in the green region. That's where row zero is, is inside x. And then um, if r is bigger than vt, then I stay inside xr. That's what it says. So here, that means I mainly stay inside XVT, right? And the condition when this holds is, uh, you know, is it precisely, that's precisely light cone. So, so VT, T, and I'm sort of uh, small, small, small transfer. So these, these bound, bounds, are naturally always plotted sort of in space time. Now it's just a forward light cone because the, the equation has a direction. Um, okay. So the uh, the way one way to sort of phrase this is that an energy localized part of the solution, I'm doing this energy cutoff at level E, stays inside essentially X V times T. So if I go with V times T, then it stays in there up to polynomially small errors where the decay rate outside of my light cone, that's sort of how small I am outside of the light cone, is polynomial, it's this n, so it's poly small, um, it's this n that is the locality parameter of my, my operator, my Lindbladian. So I have this sort of these moments of my uh, w's and my v, essentially, or sort of decay rates, and then um, then that sets me some polynomial decay coefficient that I, that I can achieve in the dynamical bound. Okay, so this is the kind of result that that uh, I was talking about before. Um, there's there's a light cone. Things stay essentially localized up to polynomially small errors. So um, okay, maybe I just pause in case there are questions about the main result.
can I can I make a comment? Sure. Maybe. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Hi. Uh, maybe you can call it micro local SMS. You were you were insisting that everything is local, but in fact, SMS are micro local face based SMS. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, I'll get to that a little bit more later. Um, yeah. Uh, good point. So I did assume right that the W's are localized in face space if I take them to be pseudo differential operators. And I guess, as Michael well knows, when we discuss the proof, um, we'll see somehow that in the end, sort of the, the control is sort of really in, happening in phase space, precisely because we have the energy variable and we have the position variables that, are that, that don't commute. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, then uh, let me sort of move on. Um, so I wanted to make this comment at the bottom here on the energy localization. Uh, we localize rho t with the spectral localizer at time t, not at time zero. Um, and that's another way to say what Michael just said. Um, in other words, we what we really control is the e-bounded energy part of the whole evolution, rho t, which um, that's the thing we actually dynamically control, which is sort of a microlocal quantity. Um, and therefore we only get information about that at time T. Now, I think it should be possible in principle to only require the bounded energy part to be initially localized. Um, but sort of you know, so the, the high energy part, if you squeeze it initially, it just flies away. Uh, it's hard to control that anyway. But sort of for convenience, I would say um, we just localize the entire state. So that's just a comment on this energy localization. Let me talk a little bit more about uh, this kappa, because I think that's interesting. So far, I just said there's an, a maximal speed kappa that's finite. Um, and that's sort of, if my V is bigger than this kappa, then sort of I stay inside XVT. So kappa plays the role of a maximal speed of the system. So what is kappa? So the proof actually gives an explicit expression for kappa. Um, and it's a norm of a certain operator that I want to explain now. And the assumptions on L guarantee that this, uh, actually the assumptions with n equal to one guarantee that this number is finite, that this norm is a finite number. So this uh, has two, two parts, this norm. So it's uh, DE of X appears here. What's DE of X? DE of X is an energy localized version of distance. So in the middle sits D. D is the distance from the region X. That's clearly relevant in when I compute sort of how far things spread outside of X. X is the thing where I'm initially localized and D is the distance to that, okay? That's clearly relevant. It has to be smoothened because we'll wanna take derivatives. But apart from that, just the distance uh, to X. And then this gets localized in energy. So, you know, this is not a trivial object because of course energy and position don't commute. Um, so right, you can call this a microlocal distance, um, and um, and uh, this so this DE of X um, is sort of depends both on the energy cutoff on the and on the region X, um, and so this appears. So therefore, first point right. Therefore, the speed depends on the energy, as it has to. Um, 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 and the second thing is L uh, L prime is the, the, just the Hilbert-Schmidt adjoint of L, which you know you can calculate easily. It essentially looks very similar to, to L. Um, so, so you take this L prime and you apply it to DE of X, um, which is um, um, you know, a bounded operator by our assumptions, and uh, take the norm. And that's the maximal speed that we get. Now, how can we understand this? Uh, let's just, for the sake of interpretation, look at the case where there's no environment. If there's no environment, then all this is gone, right? So let me just cross it out. I suppose this is all gone, and it's just this. Um, then um, the L prime will be hitting, you know, this DE, this commutator will be hitting that. Of course, the spectra, uh, the GEs, the approximate spectra projectors will commute with the Hamiltonian so I can pull them out. And I just get this expression. 
I get the commutator with dx um, of the Hamiltonian sort of spectrally localized. So this is sort of a spectrally localized or energy localized norm of a velocity operator. Why do I say velocity operator? Well, think of just the Heisenberg evolution of the position observable, right? That's this, right? That's the the the, the, the Heisenberg evolution of the position observable is the velocity, um, and that's given by the commutator with the Hamiltonian. And so that that you know, that's reasonably and quantum the quantum velocity operator, the norm of the velocity operator is the speed, um, and of course we have some energy localization to make the speed finite. Um, since our Hamiltonian is unbound. So you can think of this as an energy localized norm of velocity operator in the case where I just have the Hamiltonian in the closed quantum system case. And now in the case where I don't just have the Hamiltonian, where I sort of bring it back, then it's just I have to also include the environment. So sort of the blue sentence at the bottom sort of summarize what I'm trying to communicate here, that this kappa is an open quantum system analog of the norm of velocity operator. And the norm of velocity operator is the maximal speed of the system, okay? And it depends on energy as it should. So that's kind of the interpretation behind this. So the, the proof gives sort of a rather explicit uh, expression for this for this kappa. Okay, so that's part of the result um, that, that sort of uh, we also get, this is of course just a bound on the maximal speed, right? It's not necessarily the maximal speed in any concrete model, uh, we may expect the maximal speed to be smaller. In fact, sort of in many models for, say, quantum friction, if you start with something that's moving very fast, faster than the environment allows, you'd actually expect that this thing slows you down. But uh, you know, we 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 can only prove that uh, possibly in certain concrete models. And again, the goal here is to be very general. Okay, so you can analyze. I think it's interesting to analyze. You know, if you can say more about this operator in concrete model systems, and therefore you know get bounds on, on the speed or get, look into quantum friction, um, and for certain specific choices of environments. Okay. So um, that's that's the main result I wanted to talk about. Let me talk a little bit about the proof methods that go into this. So here's sort of one sort of broad idea of the proof um, is to so it's a dynamical bound. So as is very common. Um, in order to understand how things happen from zero at the time t, we want to take a derivative and control the derivatives and control things along the dynamics, uh, how things change. Uh, for this, we use this, what uh, at some point was called Astlo formalism. Astlo stands for adiabatic space-time localization observables. Also, it's been called propagation observables in the past. Um, this formalism really has its roots in this 1988 paper of Siegel and Sofa. Um, and uh, we'll look into this approach now a little bit, bit more, but it turns out really this is um, really a very robust method um, and you know, I'm really charmed by it. Um, so here's the definition um, of the Oslo for the purpose of this problem. You have to change the definition of Oslo for each problem, but the overall idea is, uh, is similar. So here is it for this problem. I introduce a suitable class of cutoff function. And this class will actually be quite important that it's sort of chosen correctly. Um, so I call this sort of X sub delta, but I just just look at the picture. This is a, it's a cutoff function that goes from zero to one and sort of one at infinity. And it's smooth, of course, and has various other properties that I won't list here. Uh, so I take a function and then I, using functional calculus, I define this new function. So I plug into my function. Remember DE, let me just write it again here, DE, uh, maybe here, DE is this energy localized distance function. So I take my spectral projector, distance to X, spectral projector. Now that's an operator. Um, um, it's not a function. Um, and I put it into my cutoff function, like minus VT divided by S. Okay, so a few comments. So what is the idea? Uh, first of all, let's ignore the S at the bottom for a second. What is this function doing? Uh, and ignore the GEs, right? If I ignore the GEs, then the, uh, the function is just D minus VT. So it's a cutoff function. It looks outside of the light cone because it's one for large arguments, right? It's one for large arguments, D minus VT. D minus VT is large outside of the light cone. So it tracks leakage outside of the light cone. That's what it checks. And it does so dynamically. That's sort of the first idea. So dynamically track leakage outside the light cone. 
hopefully leakage is initially small and hopefully doesn't sort of have a big derivative. At the first idea, the second really important observation is that you're allowed to put uh, one over S here, where S is essentially the distance that we're looking at R, or is essentially also, if you like, you know, R is essentially VT. So this um, is a really important observation. What does this mean? It stretches the function, of course, and stretches this on a, on a long scale because we're interested, of course, in cases where it's sort of time is short compared to distance, which means distance is relatively large. And so you're taking the function that cuts, counts particles outside the light cone, you're stretching it on the scale of the light cone, which makes it move really slowly, which is why we call this adiabatic, okay? It's sort of adiabatic in space-time, right? Because in the numerator, I have a D and a T. So I stretch both, so I'm adiabatic in space-time. That's the reason for the name. Um, uh, never mind now that at the moment, the distance function is also energy localized. Let me just think of distance for the moment. And so this is extremely clever uh, idea going back to, uh, as far as I know, this, this 88 paper. Um, so why is this good? Well, it turns out, of course, in the problem, there's no large parameter. Um, but um, so you need to sort of find one in the proof to help you. And of course, it's a statement that's only interesting for distances large. So some, otherwise you can hide everything in the constant. And then of course, in, in all proofs, at some point you wanna use that distance is large. Uh, but here it's sort of baked into the method from the very beginning because you're making your things sort of adiabatic or as you know, sort of different word that sort of maybe uh, resonates with a different crowd is sort of, as you have a semi-classical parameter. Um, semi-classical parameter that makes, you know, derivatives and commutators with this operator will now be small. You know, S is large, so one over S is small. So it's sort of built into the method from the very beginning um, to have some kind of semi-classic adiabatic, adiabatic tools, even though the statement a priori doesn't look like it is, has a parameter that's large, respectively small. Okay, so how is this also now related to what we want to do in the theorem? So something we show, which is, uh, you know, a good part of the work of the paper is to show this, uh, through some something that I would call essentially sort of commutator expansions, semi-classical like methods, um, is that the Oslo at time zero is essentially the indicator function of the complement. You just sort of think of, you know, I, I throw away the VT, right? At time zero, I throw away the VT in here. Then it's just D over S. And if, when is D large? Well, if I'm outside of X. And you know, then this function is sort of one outside of X. So this is, uh, you know, that's something you have to prove, um, but that's sort of maybe believable. And then uh, similarly, I have to compare the Oslo at time T to something that is more like in the statement. The statement, it was more like this side, the G's outside, and I was checking space locally. Because in the statement, we sort of want to spectrally localize, not the distance function. We don't want to have a statement. I mean, it's sort of, you could write it down, but maybe it wouldn't be so nice. You don't want to have a statement about a spectrally localized distance function. The spectrally localized distance function is a tool. Um, the, the state you want to control is you want to take the state, you want to cut off its energy, you want to say how much of the bound energy part is outside of some region. So therefore we need to, if we're going to track the Oslo, we should compare it to something about space. So in this, in this inequality, we're saying if we've controlled the Oslo at time t, we've also controlled spatial, you know, this, this d no longer has an e, that's my point. This D no longer is an E, so that's the usual distance function. Then we've also controlled where we are in space and up to sort of pulling out these, these things. So the point of the, all this is to say, let's go back to the theorem. Our goal is to prove something small. We can express that something is small by an upper bound through these statements I just sort of hand waved by an Oslo expectation not growing too much in time. So this is the expectation of this Oslo XTS at time t, so I test rho t against xds, and this is its expectation at time zero. Once I have this, I can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus and I can phrase things about, I want to prove a bound of the derivative of the oscillator, okay? So this sort of brings our whole goal and reformulates in terms of growth of this oscillator, which is you know something um, that's uh, better suited for the method. Um, and so the, these approximations are non-trivial, but let's sort of assume we've done this now and we just need to control the time derivative of the S. So let's take the time derivative and, you know, I take the time derivative, there's two T's in here, it hits one of them, you know. Um, so the easier one is when the when I hit the time derivative of the Oslo itself, that's the partial DT here. And then the other possibility is that the, I hit the, the time derivative hits the state, then I get an L out, 
I throw the L over to the other side as an L prime uh, using that L prime as the Hilbert Schmidt adjoint. So then, you know, my state rho T gets tested against this sort of derivative. And sometimes people call that the Heisenberg derivative in the Schrodinger context. But anyway, it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of derivative of an operator. And we need to control this derivative now. Okay, and so one part comes from the explicit time dependence and one comes from the equation. Okay. So, um, so here's sort of the, the main sort of thing that makes everything work and the proof is something that uh, we call recursive monotonicity estimate. Um, you might also call it time dependent Moore estimate. Um, the reason for this name Moore estimate is that underneath of course, inside L prime sits a commutator. So somewhere there's a commutator that has a sign. Um, so that's why it's sort of related to this more theory, but it's a time dependent version. Um, and so here's sort of the, the thing uh, that we're trying to uh, prove. And so overall, overall, of course, once now we're computing a derivative and a dynamical problem, we're trying to sort of somehow close something, right? So some, you have some kind of Gronwald type intuition or goal that you want to close something, then do some kind of iteration uh, to prove a dynamical bound. So something has to close at some point. Um, okay, so now let's compute this, you know, this capital D is this, um, I wrote it down before, right? So capital D chi TS is DT chi TS explicit time derivative plus L prime chi TS. Now, one of them is pretty easy. DT chi TS is pretty easy because we just do it here. DT chi TS is DT, you know, remember chi is DE minus VT over S. So if the explicit time derivative just hits this, I just have the chain rule minus, I don't know if anyone can read this, but let's see, minus Vs times chi prime Vs. Uh, so this minus V over S is you know, accounted for. That's a good term uh, that this has a negative sign. So this is sort of a good term that we have in the bank. I don't know if, let me just focus on that. That we already have in the bank. We're trying to upper bound the derivative. This derivative is sort of negative to first order. Um, uh, the, the explicit part of the time derivative is negative. So um, then, of course, I also have the other part. I have the L prime. And that's responsible for all the rest. Okay. Um, so this is sort of part two, and this is all part two. And this is part one. This is part one. So part one is really easy. Um, and then all the rest. So I compute this uh, derivative L prime using the helfer sirstrand formula. You know, this is some indicator function of some distance. We, we ex uh, express this through resolvents because resolvents have nice commutators. Higher commutators are small because of the one over S. That's sort of roughly speaking the idea. Um, so it's some kind of semi-classical like expansion. Um, and then one needs to symmetrize it to which produces more commutators to get operator inequalities and re sort of retain the localization. But you know, just going through this, um, one obtains an operator inequality of this form that's written up here. Um, and you see that, let me sort of erase everything that I've written. So lo looking back at um, just the expression itself, you see there's a certain self-similarity that we have um, that is gonna be important to close it. So I have the first derivative. And remember V is bigger than kappa because I'm outrunning the speed. So the first derivative is actually negative. Chi prime is positive because it's an increasing cutoff function. So the first derivative is sort of negative. That's really great. That's a really good news because we're trying to upper bound the derivative. Now the next subleading term, which comes with a higher power of one over S is positive. So we need to control that. Now the, the, the idea is that uh, we can use this estimate uh, and iterate inside the function class. So something I want to sort of point out that I start with a chi, but then the subleading term is a chi tilde, has a little twiddle. So for every chi, I get a chi tilde in the subleading term. And now what I can do is I can try to control. So you see there's a similarity. This term is essentially the same as this term up to a one over S and up to a sine. Those are the only differences. If I sort of forget that my function is a different representative in the cutoff function class, if I'm allowed to forget that, then they differ just by sine and one over S. So then I can use this to bound, you know, whenever I have something that looks the same as itself, but smaller, that's a boot that yells bootstrapping, right? Um, so, so now I move this, this term to the other side, I integrate, then I can drop this because I'm con controlling something positive, move this to the other side, I arrive at this equation at the bottom. I just moved it over, dropped the left side and integrate. 
bit nothing more. And so then I, then I can control uh, the integral of this chi prime by an integral over chi tilde prime, and I've gained a one over s. So this is the key. This is the key gain. So up to changing the, the representative in the function class, I gained a one over s. But now I just iterate that. Now I apply the same estimate to chi tilde. I get a chi tilde tilde. I gain another one over s, and so on until I have everything order estimized. So the way I would sort of paraphrase this at a, at a high level, it's some kind of Gronwall argument uh, in a function space. So where sort of the actual object that you're controlling changes, the function changes, but remains in the same cutoff function space. Um, and if you iterate this, you get sort of so everything is order s to the minus n, just the error is left over because uh, you can't get rid of the error. And, and that's that gives you the bound, essentially. OK, so let me just um, briefly mention. So the main technical aspect of this work, I already sort of hinted at this, was um, that the Oslo here was defined with this DE that's sort of different in some other applications and sort of here, the main challenge with that is not about the distance function, that you really have this energy localized distance function. Um, but we want to, in the end, make a statement about space. And in the end, we want to make a statement about distances. So these two things I mentioned at the beginning, when we compare the theorem, the goal, to the Oslo growth, they are sort of uh, half the work in the paper is to actually make these comparisons through sort of yet another uh, sort of semi-classical expansion, Hefeziostrand expansion, moving lots of resolvents around. Whereas sort of the key technical issue there uh, is that, um, you know, you, you have a Sjöstrand, but the operator you're expanding in is this distance. And the distance, of course, an unbounded function because the distance grows like x. So you have to be careful not to put operator norms on distances ever. You always have to match distances with the right resolvents, which is then a bounded operator. That's sort of very roughly speaking. Um, let me, I don't think, there's much time for this, but just let me very briefly mention that I'm hinted. At, so that's what I want to say about open quantum systems, period. Um, I mentioned the beginning that the same approach broadly construed works for lattice bosons, um, including long range ones. And uh, I don't think I want to go through this. These are just two slides. I just want to sort of do this very briefly. Let me look at a totally different model. Bose-Hubbard type Hamiltonian, or more generally, you know, long-range Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian, where I have some kind of boson hopping um, given by this matrix HXY, the hopping matrix, and some density-density interaction. I assume the hopping matrix has some moment. That's my N. That's, again, my locality assumption. That could be quite long-range if it has the moment. Um, and then my maximal speed is the first moment. And then you know there's there's various ways uh, one can look at propagation estimates for lattice bosons. And I mentioned earlier there's sort of nice recent work by these people, but let me just sort of give you one version that I think is nice because it works for long range bosons quite generally. It's sort of a more coarse estimate, a rougher estimate than a Lee Robinson bound, but it works for long range bosons. And it says essentially, not bother you with the theorem. It says the transport of a macroscopic fraction of particles takes time proportion of distance. So there is a light cone for macroscopic particle transport in these systems, uh, even for quite long range hopping, all we need is the second moment. Um, and um, and so this is interesting. And so far as the linear Lee Robinson bound, the usual light cone breaks down for long range interacting spin systems in this in this range of power laws. Mario, so, so, so this is only for unitary time evolution. This time. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's a good point. Yeah. This is unitary. So I just wanted to sort of have this sort of as a I don't know, trailer or something of some other talk I could give just to really show this should feel very different. This should feel very different. There's a many body discrete Bose system. I just want to say in passing that the same general Oslo methods can be adapted to prove this result also. So I think it's just a comment about the method being, you know, these are different columns in that table I had originally, the method being able to accommodate also physically very different situation. So that was really all, uh, but thanks for the question. That's a very important clarification. Yeah, that was unity. Um, let me just finish with a summary. Um, so, what we talked about today were propagation estimates for the dynamics of open quantum systems given by coupling a continuum Schrodinger operator, so minus Laplacian plus V, to an environment as described by Alain Bladian. 
the result shows that initially localized states sort of stay inside a light cone. Right? They, it's an effective light cone um, where the slope of the light cone is given by an explicit number, a uh, finite number, which is sort of plays the role of a norm of a velocity operator for an open quantum system in the continuum. Um, and the other uh, point I wanted to convey is that this Oslo method seems to be quite robust. Um, so two future directions. Um, I think it would be really interesting, right? This Oslo method gives you this expansion. We saw this a recursive modernity estimate. There was a leading term, a subleading term. I think it would be really interesting to look at situations where you can understand the leading term more precisely, certain initial states where it doesn't get bounded by the norm, but you can really sort of calculate it. Uh, that will certainly require looking at a very specific model, but perhaps this expansion idea can still be useful. They are proving something like maybe quantum friction that your particle slows down or uh, diffusion even, if you can somehow show the first term vanishes, uh, the first order term vanishes and you sort of you know, next order. Um, and sort of another question, which maybe actually sort of uh, connects to Hal's question. So have, after having heard the two topics I mentioned, I think it's a natural next thing to look at is to take uh, lattice bosons and couple them to an environment, um, sort of open lattice bosons. Um, but that's just two possibilities. And yeah, I guess I'll stop here. Thanks very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Marius, for this uh, this very clear and interesting talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and just ask away. Okay, Marius, thank you very much for this beautiful talk. And I have two questions about the about something you mentioned in your in your talk. The first one is you were you were talking about the uh, this uh, channels quantum channels preserving trace. So what happens for this system with the infinite trace? Could you try to kind of uh, think about this approach you de developed for infinite trace case? I'm not so for me a good question. I haven't really thought about it. To me, sort of. When I'm really describing quantum states, I always think of a finite trace situation. I'm not really thinking of um, of a situation where there would be infinite trace. I first have to think about the physical situation. Maybe you're thinking of some kind of positive density, but then um, even then, I don't necessarily see physically uh, what that what that situation would describe. So look, locally finite, like in what you said, positive density or positive temperatures. Of course, in this case, you might you might have to go to the system algebras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that could be interesting. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So the other other question is about the you mentioned about the return to equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Now, would you think that maybe? Uh, maximal velocity bounds, bounds on upper bounds on, on velocity of propagation might uh, tell something about propagation, uh, return to the time, time scale for the return to equilibrium. Well, unless it's sort of about locality in space, then I wouldn't necessarily see that. Um, it seems more like to be about energies and dissipation than about locality in space, unless the equilibration mechanism is one that's about locality. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, I think, from my perspective, the return to equilibrium question is quite well studied. Um, so, I mean, of course, there's, I'm sure there's ways this could be useful, but so from my perspective, that's the subject that people have looked at more for open quantum systems. Are there any further questions? Yeah, can I ask a naive question? So uh, I think this presence of projector GE makes mm -hmm. the uh, result harder to understand. Mm -hmm. And physically, yeah. So now, of course, of course, I I I, I understood that something you you need something like that to bond the energy. But can't you think about a version without GE and 
like assuming something for initial state and something about your your cross operators and prove something like that without having uh, without having this projection projection operator. Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. I think we we talked about this at some point, and then we sort of uh, decided on this micro local version, as as Michael called it, um, as as we were sort of writing it. Um, I think it's probably possible to do something, but it would be sort of everything would be a little bit different. Hmm. Um, so I think it's a very interesting question, sort of a, a natural one. There needs to be some energy cutoff, right? Um, yeah. And and so yeah, I I think that's a it's a very reasonable um, suggestion. I think it's probably possible to do with these methods, but we haven't really looked into it. And I agree, it uh, could make it. Uh, more palatable to some people, yes. Well, can, can I say so? For other people, it could be uh, more palatable to have microlocal estimates. <laughs> I mean, microlocal estimates are very natural. Face space estimates are very natural for propagation. Instead of saying that I'm I'm looking at the entire space for all possible velocities, you say I'm looking at the certain areas in on in the in the in a space with a certain with a certain cones or certain bounds on velocities yes but is it is it also natural to put this projection at the final moment rather than the initial yes. mm -hmm. but that's what my my local estimate is mm -hmm. it means you localize things in the phase space Not initially, but but propagation uh, at the time t. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask one more naive yeah. question? So this is related to Michael's previous question, but so can you think about some application of this bound? I mean, Lee, the original Lee Robinson had many beautiful applications. But... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So um, to my mind, um, so the first thing that I think would be sort of mm -hmm. interesting to look at is this first bullet point, mm -hmm. um, to sort of try to use the method to get uh, a more sort of concrete estimate for the speed in some system, or maybe even prove diffusion or something like that, um, sort of to have a sort of a better handle or to prove some effect like quantum friction. Um, but of course, you know, these kind of uh, statements about the, this is, in the end, it's a quantum channel, right? Um, and you, there are ways to sort of quantify the information content of a quantum channel. Mm -hmm. um, and there are sort of information theoretic protocols that you can now test, say quantum state transfer protocols, uh, where one can now use this propagation bound. And then you look at a situation where Alice is here and Bob is there, and then you see how quickly can they transmit information. And these types of bounds, what they usually give you uh, is sort of minimal time, right? Mm -hmm. In order to go from Alice to Bob, which have some distance, you require a certain time, minimally, to reliably transmit quantum information, mm -hmm. right? And so those applications, we we looked at more in the context of the bosonic systems. We didn't write those things down so much in the, because there's already sort of all this, um, literature on Lee Robinson bounds where people have used these Lee Robinson bounds in those contexts. But in principle, you know, if you have a quantum channel of locality structure, you can you can ref, you can use the bounds to to control sort of minimal times in certain uh, quantum information protocols, right? And all the protocols that would run through, you know, this channel. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you so much. I think uh, we're getting close to to the end of our of our time. Thank you so much, Marius, for uh, for this lovely talk. Um, we uh, this this will be the the last talk before the summer break. We're going to to take a little little break until September. The next talk is going to be um, on September fifth, and will be by um, by Marcello Porta. I hope to see to see all of you there uh, then. So thank you so, so much for joining us and see you again in the fall. Bye. All right, I stopped the recording.